let's start with our first uh, Benny of NEV uh, lecture. Um, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Marsh Kivi, who is the candidate for the professorship of uh, the studies. Uh, so, um, we will listen to the lecture, and after that, we can ask questions question and, and have a small discussion. And, yeah. Thank you very much. So, thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk about uh, my work within the framework of, of the NIA uh, Legendi Lecture. And uh, so, I was thinking for some time what, what should I talk about, and eventually I decided that, so, so I'm currently working on a book. Uh, and so many process of discussing with, with publishers. So I thought I would just give you a kind of run through of the book. So I, I will be talking about uh, the book I am writing, which and this is the uh, this is the working title of, of the book: Urbanism and the Limits to Environmental Power. So uh, so I'm looking at uh, selected episodes of, from urbanism of the last half a century. And by urbanism, I mean a transdisciplinary culture of expertise that is centered around the urban field. So, so by urbanism, I talk about urban design, urban, urban planning, urban science, uh, and theory. So, so it's rather broad. Uh, in, in that sense, by urbanism, I mean rather broad field of expertise. Uh, and the, the premise of the book is that then has crystallized a particular type of urbanism within the last half century, roughly, that sidelines urban planning and intervenes in the city so as to facilitate its self-regulation and self-organization. So that's, that's the main premise. Uh, and then in particular, I, in the book, I, I look at the influence of systems ecology, cybernetics, and complexity science on urbanism in the context of post-industrial change. And my question is, how did we come to think of the city as a complex system? Uh, and also, so, the, so the central question is, how does the consensus among urbanists that cities are a complex system and should be governed as if they were self-regulating, self-organizing units, Contribute to the to the undoing of of democracy. So sometimes I'm trying to bring back the question of politics and democracy into 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 urbanism. Uh, and just just to give you a um, brief note on on the relation between my research and and my teaching. So the book has crystallized over several years of my thinking how to teach urbanism and also my frustration with the way in which urbanism has been popularized in the last 10 or 20 years as either a pop science or the putative urban age, as a technocratic universal problem solver, or a kind of hooray activism which is full of good but simplistic intention. So what I want to talk about is not exactly a manifesto, but it's rather could be read as a kind of negative program that examines a series of challenges, uh, if not intellectual traps, that we need to uh, address, or that at least I would like to address. And, uh, and I want to begin with, oh, it's actually, okay, so I might to have <laughs> this little dance. So I, so I want to begin with an observation by architect and theorist uh, Zeynep Chalit Alexander, who recently described a tendency in design studios to use large amounts of data rather than historical examination to justify decisions. So this is the quote. Uh, uh, the point uh, she made, and I want to emphasize, is not only one about the, the precedence of data over theoretical understanding and historical investigation, uh, but one that notes a homology between data of different order, whether they, they be, as she writes, flow diagrams of energy consumption, images of brain scans, 
maps of transportation networks or models of thermal distribution. So I would argue that this style of knowing, uh, which Alexander describes as neo-naturalism, describes even more appropriately urbanism. The very, the very fact that architecture has come to, uh, in, within the last 20 years, roughly prioritize the field of urbanization over discrete objects, testifies to this. So what a better example is that today of an endless, bottomless database than the contemporary city. So uh, Zeynep Alexander underlines the significance of epistemology to architectural practice. Uh, the question, how do we know and structure the field of intervention? How do particular ways of uh, structuring this field of uh, influence our decisions? How do historically and geographically situated forms of knowledge condition uh, equally situated forms of governing? And as she uh, further writes, As she further writes, uh, when data eclipses all other forms of evidence in the discipline, the world is rendered as an unbroken, uninterrupted field devoid of politics. So, so that's the meaning of, of, the, of her concept, neo-naturalism. So to know the world solely as data or information is, according to Alexander, uh, it means to naturalize uh, world and in that way evacuate politics and and the possibility to, to question how the world is. So uh, so why I fully agree with uh, with this diagnosis, I believe the issue runs deeper than and historically precedes uh, the current f uh, fetishization of so-called big data. So the hypothesis I uh, propose in the book is uh, that these forms of naturalization and depoliticization uh, can be traced to forms of positivist knowledge associated with the notion of the city as a system, the notion of urban system. In other words, uh, what I propose is that our current in uh, uh, fashion for data is symptomatic of the historically longer process of rethinking cities as uh, complex systems. Uh, so let me note, uh, let me give a kind of brief explanation because what I'm proposing my sound, might sound counterintuitive. And of course, the fact that cities are complex systems might seem, seem uh, incontrovertible. Yeah? So it's difficult to question this proposition. Uh, and yet, precisely, I want to show that there is a contested history and politics to this premise. Uh, which is rife with unexamined assumptions and anti-democratic bias. So on its face, the argument might appear contrary to common sense, uh, which associates complexity precisely with the limits to uh, modernist hubris. No? So often you see uh, uh, urbanists uh, who talk about complexity, often you see them when they present, so the first slide is Corbusier uh, and his hand showing the city and the, the argument is that well with the complexity we know that this is not the, the right model so I'm not proposing to go back to Corbusier but I'm kind of interested to investigate the claim uh, that is centered around the, the truth of complexity so to speak so, so take the story that has been repeated a, a, a thousand times in which the arrogant urban planner of New York City Robert Moses who masterminded the demolition of Lower Manhattan is defeated by humble urbanist and uh, self-professed lover of old urban fabric, Jane Jacobs. And Jacobs famously described urban planning as being built on an, I quote, foundation of nonsense, end of quote, and a discipline that ignores what was according to her, the fundamental truth of cities, that they are complex systems. So, but I am interested in, in the statement, in the statement that cities are complex systems, not as a truth proposition, but as a, but as a historical proposition. Uh, in other words, my aim is not at all to prove that cities are or are not complex systems, 
uh, and I want to really emphasize this point. So uh, it's not all about proving if cities are or are not complex systems, but rather to examine effects and consequences of this belief on on the urban and on the forms in which the urban has been governed. So that would mean, uh, to continue with the previous example, uh, not only to admire uh, Jane Jacobs for her audacity and success in, uh, in uh, uh, resisting uh, Robert Moses and the whole uh, modernist uh, planning apparatus, but also demonstrate how uh, her widely celebrated vision of spontaneously grown uh, cities has been complicit in uh, gentrification, displacement, and other forms of, of social injustice. So borrowing the terminology from Michel Foucault, we could say that the idea of complex urban systems constitutes the political or governing rationality of urbanism, and is the pivot of what he called the power knowledge, or sometimes also translated as knowledge power. So, so, that, so that's again the point that was already uh, present in the quote by Alexander, that the forms of knowledge, the way in which we know cities, or which we think we know cities, is, uh, is uh, deeply uh, connected with the way in which then we govern the city. So some knowledge and politics can be uh, separated. This, maybe, this is really my kind of critique towards forms of uh, modeling uh, or simulating cities which claim that, that knowledge and politics are, could be in some ways a bit, a bit separate. And, and this is then where the concept of environmental power, so maybe you've been wondering what do I mean by environmental power, and it was used in the title. So this is where the concept uh, uh, comes into play. Uh, and be, so before addressing the relevance uh, of, of the concept uh, to the study of urbanism, let me briefly explain the, the, the provenance of the, the intellectual provenance of the term. So the concept of environmental power, uh, sometimes also uh, environmental governmentality, comes from, again, from Michel Foucault's uh, reading of neoliberal thinkers, such as uh, famously Friedrich Hayek, and uh, the theorist of uh, human capital, uh, North American theorist of human capital, Gary Becker, and, and some others. And then specifically the German so-called ordo liberalism. So Foucault emphasize, uh, emphasizes how neoliberalism is essentially a critique of the state, a form of uh, state phobia, uh, which however doesn't mean that neoliberals do not need uh, or didn't need the state. The point he makes is that the neoliberals want to intervene not on the players, on players, but on the environment that shapes them, the rules of the game, so to speak. Such as rejection of uh, urbanism's institutional legacy as a disciplinary apparatus of the, uh, the welfare state. So of course such urbanism could be called postmodern, and has been called postmodern or postmodernist. Uh, but what I claim, it has nothing to do with the style with which the, the term postmodernism is often uh, in, in architectural debate. So the term postmodernism is associated with a, with a historically specific style of 1980s. Uh, while what I'm interested in is to trace a longer kind of historical trajectory so that kind of contains postmodernism, but also exceeds. And so that's why I. Uh, I'm avoiding uh, the term in this context of modernism and rather describing it with, with not as a style but as, as a form of uh, as a form of intervening. The logic, what is the logic of, of intervention in, in which urbanism tries to intervene in the city? So, so the question I ask is about the transformation of urbanism into a humble or rather humble looking apparatus for liberating urban life from that which is deemed to inhibit, inhibit this life, such as uh, bureaucratic planning and, and welfare protection. So, uh, so then in the book I examine the link between, on the one hand, uh, this environmental power, and on the other hand, uh, system theoretical perspectives on the city. So, 
in doing so, I stemmed Foucault's predominantly metaphorical treatment. And so, so when Foucault talks about environment, it's rather metaphorical. He talks about the legal environment, yeah? and how legal environment creates, uh, uh, for example, when uh, economists talk about uh, uh, business friendly environment, right? Uh, or uh, creating a legal framework in which it is easy to, uh, to uh, create a company. Yeah? So, 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 so often you, you hear the, the word environment, but it's rather metaphorical, right? And then there is another, uh, another context in which I would use environment, which is sort of like, you know, in the context of the debate about climate change. You know. but, so, so it's kind of, I'm looking in a way how we, we can actually connect these debates, and one way how we can, uh, how we can uh, connect these debates, but I claim that we can connect these debates, is, uh, is by extending the, this kind of metaphorical, uh, the metaphorical concept of the environment uh, to encompass the so-called environmental term in architecture uh, that took place roughly in the 1960s and, and 70s. And, and in, in this context of environmental term in architecture, uh, or, or, or to, put it, uh, to put it differently, uh, the, the term environment in, in the context of architecture has a range of meaning, has a great range of meanings, including on the one hand, urban ecology, uh, and of course the question of prote nature protection, climate change, uh, sustainability, resilience, and so on. And on the other hand, the question of cybernetic media. Right? So the city as an environment of information, the city as an environment of data, the city as, a, as precisely a system self regulating system. Right? So nature, to us, to be very simply, nature and uh, data. So you might recall that two years ago I organized a conference that was titled Architecture, Nature, and Data. So that's, that's the kind of uh, the program I'm interested in. Uh, and yes, so, so, so in a way, while, uh, while the, the argument I, I made draws on Foucault's reading of neoliberalism, I equally attend to uh, the process of rethinking the city as a complex ecological and information so now uh, to briefly back to Hayek uh, before, uh, before sharing with you uh, uh, briefly the, the material with which I work. So it is well known that, that Friedrich Hayek uh, made complexity the pivot of neoliberal governance, yeah. through the, the, the neoliberal governance through market. And the notion of complex market whether in finance, real estate, or housing, has since become the, the pivot of late capitalist good governance and also the absolute horizon of, of political change. And I think that this is uh, often not acknowledged enough the way in, in which neoliberalism is not about like saying that we know how uh, economy works, but it's precisely saying that we don't know and nobody can know how economy works, which is precisely why socialism cannot work why planning cannot work, why we have to... So, in a way, uh, the, the concept of market in, within the neoliberal thought is like a computer. Yeah. So the market is the, is the ultimate computer. Yeah. It's the processor, you know, not computer, it's the processor. So the market is the, is, is the processor of information. Yeah. And the price is the signal. Right. So, uh, in that sense, uh, you could say that that neoliberalism thrives precisely on this idea of unknowability of market, right? While socialists, at least historically, you know, they always, uh, you know, state their uh, the socialist project on on the on on the the idea of the plan, like, like we can plan the future. Uh, then, then, then the point of neoliberal critique of socialism is precisely that planning is impossible, right? and by extension also urban planning. So, so this is the challenge today, if we think is planning urban valuable or not. So how, so how, do, we, uh, how do we address uh, this common moment? So, uh, so and then I argue that complexity is similarly the nexus of urbanism's environmental power and of the problematics that is central, centered around the question, how to facilitate the self-regulation and self-organization of, of urban systems. So there's, there's again this paradox I'm kind of uh, 
trying to describe, it's, it's very difficult, I'm always like writing new, and new sentences, how to describe it, but essentially what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to, to grasp is the paradox of, on the one hand, saying that cities are self-organizing system, but on the other hand, we still need to intervene in some way. So, like, so what does it mean that if something is self-organizing, so why do we need to intervene? Yeah, so, so there is this kind of a circularity of, of the, uh, or recursivity of, of, the, of the power. And so, so let me just briefly develop the, uh, the critique now. So departing from a conventional view that systemic complexity poses limitations to anthropocentrism, I want to show uh, what my hypothesis is that the complexity paradigm precisely preempts democratic contestation in the city. So in this vein, urbanism intervenes by sensitizing uh, the urban to cybernetic and ecological forms of distributed post-human agency, but also, but also by obviating difficult debate, uh, closing legitimate channels for expressing collective grievances and eroding citizenship. So the rise and spread in urbanism of uh, environmental power is consistent with the political and economic and cultural change underlays capitalism and processes such as privatization and financialization of uh, urban land, real estate speculation, and uneven urban development. So the critical point uh, I make is not simply that urbanists, including municipal policymakers, have retreated from planning, but that they have uh, that they have complied. Uh, with the idea of complex urban system, just like that of complex urban market, being the pivot of urban governance. So again, it's not about retreat from planning, but it's a kind of an idea of planning that is essentially about non-planning. And then, uh, this is also actually the title of, of my first chapter. Um, so, and so I will interrupt or, or stop my argument here and and even if I can't go into details of the primary material, I would like to give you an overview of the, I would like to give you an overview of the material that I have worked with or that I address in the book. And and some of the stuff is, is some of the stuff is developed. Uh, some of the stuff is has been already published as uh, as an art as, as articles. Some of them it's more like like, like kind of. Uh, rough sketch of what I want to do and I need to uh, to, to visit archives and do field work and interviews. So, so, so it's a bit like, um, uh, so, like so it's a bit uneven so, so, so sorry for that. But I thought it would be nice to rather than focus on the one thing you know, to give you a kind of overview of, 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 of what I'm uh, working on. Especially given that uh, I have uh, one, one hour I thought this is a nice opportunity to, to talk about the whole rather than the usual conference presentation of uh, 15 minutes where you have to actually focus on one thing. So, so, so basically uh, for the rest I want to talk about these five chapters. So the, so at the moment uh, the, I, I structure the argument into five, five chapters which uh, and each is conceived as a genealogy of a particular concept uh, or, or, or idea. So the first one, uh, the first one, uh, planning by non-planning. Yeah. Uh, Does anyone have an idea how I could like twist it? Because there is quite a lot of slides, so that might it might be ideal. Fit with fit with or fit? Yeah, now it's good, yeah. I think it's good. Okay. <coughs> let's, let's hope it will work. Okay. Sorry about that. So so it, I, I begin with the with this uh, interesting article that was published in 1969. Does anyone know this piece? It's written by uh, uh Cedric Price. Urban planner Peter Hall, Rainer Bannam, historian, and uh, and Paul Barker, who was uh, uh, who was the editor of of, the, uh, of this new society newspaper uh, where this was where this appeared in 1969. 
And uh, non, this idea of non-plan uh, has been compelling to urbanism as, a, as an ethos that, vali that precisely values intervening in the city while it sidelines regulatory planning and managerial, uh, managerial welfare state. So if I just give you So, so they propose uh, what they call experiment in non-planning, which is very critical against the uh, 95th, the post-war regime of, of uh, bureaucratic planning in 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 the UK, which is uh, according to them all regulated. And what they propose is to give, so to speak, freedom to people and let them decide. And this is how they imagine uh, the fu future, if you would let uh, people decide. So, so it's heavily influenced by. Uh, by the North American uh, urbanization, so this looks like a, a redrawing of, of uh, learning from Las Vegas by, by uh, Venturi, which is actually published later. Uh, and it's well known, Rainer, there is a documentary about Rainer Banham that is called Rainer Banham Loves Los Angeles. Okay? So he was the first historian who said Los Angeles is cool. Uh, so, I mean, so there's like a lot of uh, interesting um, trajecto trajectories uh, in intellectual and personal tra trajectory that, that uh, could be explored. Uh, but, but really the, the point uh, I'm interested in is to, to examine how this ethos of non-planning actually uh, leads not towards an idea of deregulation, but towards the idea of cybernetic regulation. Yeah? Towards the idea of, of, and then how cybernetic regulation uh, could be used as part of a post-industrial revitalization, how it leads to, to municipal entrepreneurialism. And, uh, and then, I, then I look at the, at the selected aspects to the three authors' work. So I look at the price uh, architecture, and I specifically the idea of architecture as a media environment, and then the Banham, the notion of ecology, so he, Sabana published a book on Los Angeles, which is called uh, I think For Ecology. Right? So, so when he talks about ecology, it, it, it's, uh, it's not supposed to be regularly understood by ecology, but it's a uh, techno-scientific ecology. So the city is an ecosystem. Kind of and then, and then, then uh, uh, a really interesting episode, not, uh, not that well known, is uh, Peter Hall's advocacy for so-called free ports which was then later picked up by Margaret Thatcher and, and, um, and, and uh, morphed into uh, what is today called uh, entrepreneurial uh, zones. Uh, so Keller Easterlin writes uh, interestingly about the history of entrepreneurial zones, but, but actually this, uh, this, episode, uh, this episode about Peter Hall is, is, is missing that, so I, I think that's an interesting, uh, interesting consider so how this from, you know, the idea of non-planning and how it uh, leads to uh, entrepreneurial planning actually. Uh, and then, so that, that, that's roughly the first part, and the second part of this chapter, I, well, I, I then looked at the, at the situated um, history, so to speak, of non-planning in the, today, in, in the contemporary regeneration of East London, and specifically the, the Lee Wally, the, the Lee Wally in London, uh, a site that was why it's important because it was very significant to, to price uh, to it was very significant to all these authors. For example, for example, uh, uh, ah, it's not. Well, so, so um, Cedric Price, uh, most well-known project, uh, Fun Palace that he was working on throughout the sixties, and it has been planned for three or four sites. So like. I think two or three of the sites uh, were actually in, in the on, in, uh, in Lee Wallace so first site was where is now the where is now sort of, sort of the city, uh, the financial hub of London. The second one was actually literally on the on the site where is where is uh, where uh, is now the old, the Olympic the Olympic uh, development and, and so on. So so it's kind of interesting to consider these project kind of connections. And it's the idea of, of regenerating, uh, regenerating the industrial, uh, industrial um, and landscapes of, uh, of Lee Wally and then current approaches uh, 
who uh, talk, uh, with, uh, financial development uh, or spectacular oriented uh, development of, of the kind that, that we, we've seen in, in the Olympic development. <coughs> And then secondly, it's, 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 it's precisely the, uh, the kind of neoliberal hybrid of enterprise zone legislation and ecological revitalization and forms of smart urbanism that all coalesce in the, in the current approaches in, uh, to, uh, to leave all your regeneration uh, with the with, with this latest project, with this Queen Elizabeth part that is using a lot of big data, smart sensing, and so on. So, so it's kind of very interesting. And this is this study is, is rather in the beginning, so I don't have a, at the moment, uh, uh, in a way, material. It's rather just as a, as a hypothesis. Uh, but, but just maybe a comment on, on, the, on this fun palace, which is really interesting. The, 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 the history to to to, to Pan Palace, and so so on the one hand, uh, the, as, as I already mentioned, ha, like the kind of um, that connection between on one hand is this idea of uh, indeterminacy, architecture of indeterminacy, and but also about and this, so this has been this, this has been written about quite a lot, but there's much less uh, studies on on the sites on like. On the on the kind of waste post-industrial wastelands and why the post-industrial wastelands have uh, been like why they they appealed to France as, as the sites where to actually situate the, the project and and then considering this this idea of indeterminacy this this kind of interesting trajectory from the so, so the idea of the fun palace actually it's not uh, it's not the idea of Cedric Price, but it's the idea of, uh, and I, I'm sorry if this is well known, but uh, it's, it's, it's the, the idea of uh, theatre director John Littlewood, uh, who comes from the Brechtian avant-garde theatre, uh, was active in, in post-war London, and then he came to, she came with this idea of uh, creating a space where the working class could participate in the theatre in this more uh, kind of embodied way. So she wanted to break down the boundary between the performance and, and the audience. So it comes from from the kind of radical uh, from the radical uh, say radical socialist he, uh, history, uh, and then but it gradually kind of morphed into this uh, into this kind of peculiar uh, set of ideas, and and one of them is actually this one, <laughs> which is the which is the a diagram uh, uh, created by Gordon Pass, who joined the project in. Uh, uh, not right from the beginning, but uh, in 1962. And he, he created the so-called cybernetic committee of the Fund Ballot. I think he was the only member of the committee. And, uh, and then produced uh, this type of diagram of, of, the, uh, of how the Fund Ballot should actually uh, uh, work. So, so, so in a way, he turned the kind of and then like, there is a continuity from the John Littlewood idea of like changing people or like, like creating this possibility where people can change themselves. So this uh, kind of cybernetic, uh, like kind of rendering the same idea in, in, in a cybernetic fashion as where you have the learning behavioral patterns and you can organize uh, in a way through environment, like by changing the environment you change, uh, uh, you basically change people's behavior. Right? So you don't change them directly but you change them through uh, change into the, the behavior and then uh, you know it, it, there is like a lot of interesting stuff one of them is that this is input so like input are unmodified people and then at the end we have modified people and and then, then what does it mean to that uh, and one uh, one uh, hint that that past uh, gave about what does it mean is that uh, uh, he writes somewhere that he wants to determine what is likely to induce happiness. So this idea of maybe it's not about emancipation, but it's about happiness. Which is then connected to a broader topic, and I'm sorry, I don't have time to go into details. And, and this is this is really a pervasive idea in the 1960s and 70s. And I, I, I don't know why I think we uh, it's interesting to revisit it. And then, like, I'm not historian, but I'm really interested in uh, in, the, in history because 
think we can learn a lot about also what is happening today. So, and, and this is one of one of the uh, idea, which is that uh, believe that with automate with, with an kind of increase in automation of labor, uh, people will have more free time. Yeah. So, and this 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 was this was really a big theme in the in sociology in the 1960s, and Price uh, was totally. Uh, working within that framework. Yeah. Some believe that, that there is a that rapid automation of, of production. We should, we should, so like within 10 years, people will work like three hours a day. And, and then the question is, okay, so what, what will be, what these people will do with, the, with their free time? Yeah. So, and then the risk of, okay, well, they will be just watching television. So we have to create this environment in which they, uh, people could create, could you know, spend their free time in a kind of more creative way. So he was really interested in the idea of education, universities, and, and, and so on. Uh, and so, so the connection between Ottoman, and, 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 and you know that like, it somehow, the history went in a different way. So we don't have so, that much free time. But, but, the, but, but the idea is still uh, somehow on, on the table, right? And, and I think now, now again, it's it, it kind of becoming uh, compelling to, uh, to uh, many uh, authors inside and outside uh, urban. So, so that's so that's on on the idea of non non planning. So now let me move to a uh, second chapter. So then take this as an episode, and I, I don't want to you know like this is not not the general history of of urbanism, but it, but it's rather like picking the. Episodes that I think are in some way a significant uh, to also to understand what is what is happening today. So, so the second one is ecologies of design. Here I trace the genealogy of landscape urbanism, uh, so-called landscape urbanism, and it's centered around two figures. Uh, so on the one hand is Ian Metard, Scottish architect. And, uh, and the founder of Penn Design Program in Landscape Architecture, and the second one is James Corner, the former dean of the same uh, program in, in Philadelphia, and and of course also the student of, of Metard. And so, and the question is, what kind of ecology? Like, how do they understand ecology? What kind of ecological ideas do they integrate in within their uh, the theories of urbanism. So, so with Matt Hart, so Matt Hart uh, really builds on this on the systems ecology that was that was developed in 1950s by Howard and Eugene Odum. Yeah, so they came with this concept of systems ecology, where you can model nature as a kind of metabolical system. Yeah. So, so nature is basically a metabolical system. So it's all about who eats who yeah, and how you process the energy. And uh, and, and so, so they brought this book, uh, in this very influential book in 19, uh, 1951. Yeah. So, and, and this Mark is very much, uh, in, in, in a way, kind of creating, turning ecology into, into like real science. And Matt Hart was very much taken by this idea of, of like, that urbanism could be scientific in that way. Uh, and, but, but then like, he combines this scientific uh, take on, on ecology with a range of pre-industrial influences, including uh, 18th century English landscape gardening, uh, the aesthetics, aesthetics of the picturesque, uh, and uh, Scottish moral philosophy, including Adam Smith, the well-known theorist of liberalism. So, so there is this idea of a kind of uh, liberal subject who can appreciate the beauty of unplanned nature, but, but then kind of connect it with the with the, with the science of uh, with, with the systems ecology and the idea of city as an ecosystem, and then on, on the other hand, uh, James Corner uh, and his his work or his thought pivots on the ecological resilience. Yeah. So resilience, uh, it's, it's a kind of, it's a kind of different theory which which is not centered around the, the kind of that this, that that ecosystems have an equilibrium around which they are organized, but around the idea that, that ecosystems actually do not have equilibrium, yeah? so they have like multiple equilibrium, so they can ecosystem can change from one, you know, like, uh, 
one equally related <coughs> to another. So, so uh, I don't want to go into into into, into details uh, here, but I think that it's going to be interesting to, to see how they uh, to kind of connect the, the, the transformation of within landscape architecture and urbanism and see how they in a way parallel or how they are influenced by by the transformations within ecological science within ecology with ecological science. Uh, and also, uh, then specifically, it's interesting to compare the significance of wastelands and polluted landscapes to the two architects, uh, and the continuity in terms of techniques they use, such as the uh, the famous uh, map overlay method that was used by that was used by by Meghart and, and one kind of. Uh, Credit that goes to my heart is often uh, not well known. Is that he was kind of intellectual father of the GIS, yeah? precisely with this idea that, that actually comes from that the GIS comes from this kind of engagement with urban ecology, urban nature, and how you can kind of value, like objectively value, uh, different functions in the in, in the urban or in landscape setting by by separating the function and creating the, the, these, these layers and then like layering it over and then seeing what is, where the most valued functions in a way are, um, uh, uh, in a way coalesce. And then, you know, that, that do, you know, you know, should, according to Meghar, that should inform, uh, uh, that should inform our approach to, like, to urban, or to, to planning that is kind of ecologically minded. Uh, but at the same time, it's a really interesting, uh, uh, and just maybe I should the next. This is the, the project by by James Thorne for for the livescape fresh fields part, the the largest landfill in, in in New York, which then somehow uh, develops uh, this idea of layers. Uh, but at the same time, there's a really interesting uh, tension. Between between Meghart's anti-urbanism, so so uh, so he was he, like Meghart in a way hated cities, so he saw cities as, as a kind of uh, as a kind of something almost like bad that that show how the, you know that humans are uh, humans in a way are spoiling nature to put it very simply, and and contrasting this approach of Meghart to uh, Corner's uh, James Corner's urbanophilia uh, love of. of and so, so it's kind of uh, urban of the, uh, love for the for the post industrial wasteland. So this is the, the the famous the famous project that, that he, he did in Highline. Um, so so the shift in landscape urbanism from systems to resilient ecology is also uh, and and specifically I, I think it's really interesting to consider uh, what has happened around around the Highland, and this is not, uh, I'm not making any new arguments, like there's been uh, uh, hundreds of, of, uh, of authors who, who, who wrote on this, is that, um, that uh, this is kind of distinctive uh, wasteland aesthetic uh, that is emblematic of super gentrification. So this is kind of a very interesting paradox, what is happening here. Yeah. So, uh, Traditional gentrification would be associated with like clearing the site and building a skyscraper. Yeah? But now, you know, there's a kind of soft approach, which is actually uh, gentrification by preserving nature, and like, an, or even like preserving nature in a way that simulates the, the wasteland aesthetic. As I, as I call it. And so, and, and I think this, uh, uh, the Highland release really is, is kind of not only symptomatic but also catalyzes. Uh, uh, catalyzes the kind of um, what we could call a highline effect, you know, the proliferation of uh, of, uh, of the certain kind of model of of, of regenerating post-industrial landscapes uh, uh, globally. Yeah? So, so on the one hand, the, the shift in landscape to summarize uh, landscape rules from systems to resilient ecology is consistent with the movement of real estate capital away from and back to the city. Um, but on the other hand, there are also uh, uh, the neo-colonial aspects to, to this proliferation of, of this particular uh, 
aesthetics as a, as a kind of revitalization template that alludes the socioeconomic conditions to appreciate a wasteland and other aspects to urban decay aesthetically. Mm -hmm. So not everyone can appreciate uh, decay as a, something that is cool. So, for example, if there are racial aspects to displacement facilitated by the High Line, uh, in the post-Soviet uh, world, or in, in, in post-socialist Eastern Europe, uh, there is a distinct class, also ethnic aspect, to the contrast between places stigmatized as wastelands and the proliferation of uh, wasteland aesthetic as a fashionable design tr uh, trend. And there is, uh, as uh, Sean, uh, Sean reminded me uh, recently, uh, there is a project currently uh, ongoing by Italian municipality in, in Pergrana that uh, refers to, or that right that we are inspired by, I, I call a smooth New York City High Line style pedestrian and bicycle road. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting how a sort of so, certain kind of models of what is, uh, what is, what, what is, what is, uh, the proper, uh, uh, what is kind of, what kind of development do we want? So how these models, you know, circulate. So that, that that's part of the of the question. Not only the circulation of nature, but really the circulation of the ideas about about nature and ideas about vitalization. And I have a I have a couple of uh, papers on Tallinn that, that should be hopefully published this in, in, in coming weeks that also engage with, with the idea of of uh, this wasteland. Aesthetic. Okay, uh, so let me now turn to this chapter number three, which I call the simplicity of complexity. Uh, and and he, I look at the, at the origins and spread of uh, so called the science of cities, or also called, sometimes uh, referred to as urban science. Uh, which has been pioneered primarily and since the 1970s by planner and geographer Michael Batty. And, and here I uh, examine uh, specifically the concept of complexity as the locus of power to intervene environmentally. So Batty defines the city empirically as a system of discrete behavioral patterns. The premise of, of his prolific work uh, is that planning should facilitate but not intervene into urban dynamics. So and then this is a maybe a it's it, it's kind of nuanced distinction, but but I, I really insist on the importance of this distinction. Yeah? Facilities <coughs> but not intervene. Uh, and why? Precisely because the ur because urban dynamics is considered as complex and self-organizing. Yeah? So what the planners should do according to him should facilitate self-organization. Having no theory of the urban, urban science, so it doesn't have theory of the urban. Urban science is a blend of neoclassical economy, behavioral sociology, geoinformatics, and a range of anti-modernist uh, thinkers, urban thinkers ranging from Patrick Degas to Jane Jack Occident. And the overarching conceptual framework is provided by so-called the complexity science. So what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to do here is to argue critically that uh, while uh, urban <coughs> science appears democratic because it has renounced the simplicity of earlier, science, earlier attempts to uh, formulate urban science, uh, it actually makes urbanism contingent on this complexity rather than democratic debate and, and contestation. Uh, and then I, I also looked at the again, at the application of how the how urban science is actually used in uh, in, a, in real life. So, for example, how the models developed uh, developed with it by Batty and, and developed by uh, by his laboratory, which is the UCL Center for Advanced Instruments. How, in a way, so it's a really question of knowledge. So, like, what kind of like how does urban science as a, as a form of uh, Say hegemonic knowledge. How does it intervene in this, into the city? How does it govern? Uh, 
and, and it has been used in, in, in highly contested arenas such as urban regeneration and, preserve in, and, and so, so, so Bati and, and the team laboratories is, is heavily invested in the, in the, in the regeneration of the Leah Wallet Park in, in East London, so, so it depends how these chapters connect. And at the same time, uh, they also are working with the police, you know, and developing models how you can, uh, like, predictive policing. And, 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 and as you see, the knowledge is, is really implicated in urban politics, but at the same time, it's kind of premise that, that, that data are kind of neutral. So, so this is what, what I'm kind of questioning, or, or at least trying to open a debate around. Yeah, so, so I'm not saying that this is without value or that we should dismiss it, but rather I would like to open a debate and, and ask what the urban science is doing actually to this. Uh, and, and then it's about the circulation of knowledge. Yeah? So how does the idea of urban science uh, travel across the world, across the different institutions, yeah? such as the Santa Fe Institute, which is the, the, the sort of headquarters of the, the complexity science, MIT Sensible City Lab, and other, other there's like uh, uh, tens of, of, of institutions that are in some way, um, are in some way connected Paradigm. So, so I'm interested also in institutional uh, framework. Uh, and uh, oh, okay. and so just to give you something like I've been looking actually at the at the genealogy of, of the science. So, so going back to uh, 19, uh, going back to 1970s and uh, trying to reconstruct the idea of the idea of urban science from during the 40s. So, so then, because, because, and this is really linked back to the claim I, I cited in the beginning by, by, by Zeynep Alexander that, uh, that the problem is data, but I don't think the problem is data as such, but, but the problem is that like the data is our this kind of obsession, our, our obsession with data, our belief that data can solve the cities. Uh, it's more like a symptom of some kind of, of a certain way of thinking about the cities, which, which is which is the way that we can kind of formalize cities in this type of um, this type of diagrams, and or that politics it's about uh, it's about that we can like solve politics through this kind of math, uh, game theoretical uh, approaches. So so I've been I've been like going through different uh, kind of mathematical models and and the way in which the this science is it's been built, uh, optimal design machine, cellular automata. And so, so, so it's really kind of an intellectual history, I would say, kind of inter history of ideas that, that in a way coalesce in, in certain proposition of what urbanism should be. Um, and then, well, most recently, the idea of science and the city published in journals of nature. So that's, that's uh, I think, quite. Uh, and so, so basically, w the, the project of urban science, as critic Douglas Spencer put it, makes uh, the jump from formal model to social rea reality appear natural. Okay? So, so then uh, it appears natural, so um, in that sense, this explains why. Uh, uh, why journals such as nature are uh, important outlets for uh, for scholars who work within this framework. And the idea of urban science might uh, might be anathema to architects, yet I think it is critical to engage with the reality of it gaining traction in transnational policy and urbanist circles. And th there are a couple of critics who, uh, who raised the voice, uh, uh, not necessarily against it, but who raised a kind of critical voice about the limits to, uh, to urban science, but often they, uh, they, just, they just dismiss it as, as neo-positivist, uh, missing precisely how uh, the idea of complexity functions for, uh, for Michael Batty, for example, and others, uh, as a conceptual shield against the charge of positivism. So they would say, no, no, we are not positivists because, we, because I think we don't know how the world works. The world is complex. Right, so, so I think we really need to understand again what is this complex. So, so there's a need for more nuanced critique, and the question to be asked, in my opinion, or the question I also want to ask, 
it's not whether the science of cities is positivist, but what kind of political rationality does complexity uh, and specifically the cultures of urbanistic expertise centered around complexity justify and normalize? What kind of political rationality does uh, the proposition cities are complex system justify and normalize? Uh, and, and, and I claim often that what, uh, what is today uh, the, in, within that context, for example, Batios calls for design. He's using the word design, but he doesn't mean at all uh, design as we understand, like, like for example, to design uh, objects. But design is precisely the kind of expertise to um, to both surrender to and govern complexity. Mm -hmm. so, 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 this is again uh, something that is difficult to address in, in a couple of sentences, but there is a uh, this movement called design thinking, yeah. uh, which uh, is precisely the kind of trying to make design as one as scientific, but also design then it's it's about it's about it's about uh, it's about governing complex systems rather than uh, designing objects in that sense. So so this uh, this will be kind of conclusion that where I link the science, science and back to design, to urban, to design, not urban design precisely, but to, to design. Okay, so uh, how am I doing with the time? Uh, it's so uh, well, one hour now. Ah, it's one hour? Okay. Can I have like 10 minutes or? Uh, yeah, it's fine, okay, good. So, uh, okay. uh, so <coughs> Here I, I look on uh, on theory, not specific urban theory, but but a particular moment in architecture theory that obliquely addressed what is the urban. Uh, and I, it kind of, so, so in its form of reconstructing uh, a tacit theory of urbanism that was advanced in the 1990s by a cohort of North American uh, architecture theorists, including Sanford Quinter, Robert Sommel, Sarah Whiting, uh, Jeffrey Clifton, and Michael Steeps. So their writings have been uh, often discussed under the, the rubric of projective or post-critical term. What I'm doing instead is examining the influence on them of complexity theory, as well as evolutionary developmental biology and and Schilderer's uh, neo-vitalist neo philosophy. So, and by situating the argument against the backdrop of post-Cold War technological and geopolit geopolitical change, I explore how uh, this um, millennial architecture theory conform to the double ethos of digital and capitalist triumphalism. And, and at the center of the, the chapter, or at the center of the argument, is, uh, is this uh, essay by Sanford Quinter, published in 1990. Five, but I think it was uh, originally presented at, a, uh, at an assemblage conference in New Orleans in 1994, I think, uh, where he, and when he, in, in a very exuberant and affirma very exuberant language, and affirmatively describes the contemporary city as fuzzy and swarming. So that, that's why the that's why the title, the swarming of New Orleans. Uh, and, and especially his case for urbanism that would not plan, but would flexibly accommodate urban uh, complexity. So let me just briefly, uh, so let me just look at this evocative statement that is that's from the from the from the presentation or essay. I just show you so that he made in 1994, in which he describes urbanism as a kind of pastoralism and urbanist as a kind of shepherd, mm -hmm. or pastor, which is a plain language. Mm -hmm. Both shepherd, so the, the pastoral is going to be shepherd, but you can be also pastor in the church. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and he talks about new urbanism. Yeah. So, like in the 90s, he said, yeah, new urbanism. So, what is the new urbanism? I told you to print there. So, new urbanism, as, as he called it, uh, and, and, and um, elaborated in a string of metaphors, will register the city like a tweeting, I, I go, like a tweeting interest rate dials in financial markets, and urbanists would act on it 
at my throat like a shepherd driving his herd. And this urbanism would, I quote, relinquish control to the regime of complexity. So this expression, the regime of complexity, and I, no, I think the whole expression, that we need to relinquish control of the city to the regime of complexity, it actually comes from Rem Kohlhaas uh, as a whatever happened to urbanism, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm uh, correct. But maybe not from that essay, but it's, but it's definitely from, from Rem Kohlhaas, because he uh, actually the, the, the presentation is engaging with, with the work of, of Rem Kohlhaas. So, so what so Twitter puts an, an intellectual veneer on, on Rem Kohlhaas regulations on the city, and and as I as I just suggested, he uh, he's especially kind of taken by uh, by the Dutch architect statement that we should surrender to, to complexity. Mm -hmm. And and but note how uh, you know black and white the the quote is. Okay? So permanence is bad, flexibility is good. Planning is bad, complexity is good. Control and abstract schemes are bad, softness and fluidity is good. Maybe that's even more obvious in the in this in this person. So what new urbanism is not doing, it's not planning, it's not precisely or inflexibly imposing, it's not fetishizing the integrity of the fixed abstract scheme. But what is it doing instead? It is a moving urbanism, it is a pastoral urbanism, it's an urbanism of inflection. So it's a kind of actually uh, we need this exuberant language. Yeah, so it's a kind of very extremely black and white uh, schema of what is good, what is new, what is old. And the, but the irony really is that uh, that the new urbanism he so admiringly, admiringly imagines is actually not far from what what Deleuze himself, who is. Uh, uh, and who, who was a great influence on Twitter, yeah? So he was the, actually the son for Twitter. He's the main, uh, he's the founder of the Zone Books, a very, very important the publisher. And he's also one of the, one of the uh, main figure who, who uh, kind of translated, uh, in, like literally, but also brought uh, the philosophy of, of Deleuze into a North American academia in 1980s. Yeah? So, he, so he's really a, uh, Kind of Deleuzean in, 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 the, in, the, in the sense, not only intellectual, but also institutional, so it's a kind of a circulation of ideas. But, but, but Deleuze has this really interesting uh, uh, essay, short essay that he, that he doesn't refer to, which is called The Control Society. And, and in that essay, uh, Deleuze describes how in the control society, which is a kind of post-disciplinary society, uh, and I, I would say it's precisely the society wh where, which, uh, uh, it's the society uh, that is centered around its environmental power. Yeah. So, so he describes as control society where power operates less by abstract schemes than by modulation and monitoring. Yeah. So it's, it's a kind of again, soft power. Uh, so, so the irony is that that the new urbanism that Quinter so admiringly images is actually not far from what Deleuze describes as the control society. So it's not that uh, so it's not that uh, new urbanism in that sense is so I would just say is liberating us from one type of urbanism, but then the question is, which, and this is the question that we should now as a kind of looking back historically as say, ask what kind of power he is projecting, yeah? What kind of power is the power of pastoral? Uh, and then I don't have a like answer that I could uh, present here, but, but this this is a then this is the question around which I which the chapter is centered. And specifically, uh, I think it's very instructive to revisit this episode, given its distinctive post Cold War framing of of temporality, in which the age of history and revolutions have been replaced by the age of complexity and and evolution. So you know the uh, you know the the thesis by Fukuyama yeah, that he uh, presents in 1990 that the history that the history has ended and at the same time these are all books that was ever published like early 1990s so so in 19 in early 1990s 
for, for a reason that I'm trying to understand or to reconstruct. So the, it's really compelling intellectual framework of the idea of complexity. Yeah? So the world is complex, the world is a complex system, it's indeterminate. So what so what what is happening what is happening in the nineteen nineties? Yeah? So on the one hand, end of history, end of politics we could even say, as Fukuyama claimed then. But at the same time, future is unpredictable, it's complex, right? So so what, what kind of temporality do we see and, and how how does it what does it do to organize? And and anyway, I conclude with actually looking, surveying how this how how this complexity framework, uh, in a way, became uh, dominant or at least uh, one of the one of the important uh, strengths in architectural and urbanistic education, mm -hmm. and explore its political legacy, and explore how and why it is ill-suited to address a uh, number of fundamental questions such as power, conflict, and inequality <coughs> in the contemporary city. Yeah. So, 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 so anyway, uh, and this is, this is why, because uh, I have a couple of colleagues who, who tell me like, oh, you know, this, this debate of 1990s is totally irrelevant. You know, it was just a kind of struggle between one generation of theorists and another, and it was all about like uh, positions in academia. Well, I think it is important in a way, which is precisely, and, and I think that that's why it's interesting to actually uh, to look at the, uh, to, to include uh, this kind of rather arcane debate in academia within the within this field of urbanism, yeah, because in some way it has it has this indirect influence through education, yeah. So so that so the so the relevance is precisely the way in which these ideas then enter into into kind of circuits of uh, architectural urbanistic education. They are they are then divided from the origin from the the complexity. Of, of the of the context, and then they circulate as as a kind of uh, as a kind of commonplace truism, such as uh, cities are complex system, right? Without the history of what actually uh, we've been trying to, to say with this statement. Okay, so that's about presentation. And final, uh, and then finally, uh, this is a bit jump in time and and in space, uh, and. It, this is based on uh, my recent work, uh, the article I'm, so, so this is uh, going to be published as, a, as an article very soon, and I hope to include it in the book. Uh, it might look a bit uh, off topic, uh, but I think it's interesting because it provides a counterpoint on the one hand to the anglocentric focus of the rest of the book, but also a uh, counterpoint in, in time and in, in, geographical, uh, in geographical space. And also, it, it returns back to the 1960s, where I, where I start with the, where I start with the non plan I turn to the socialist urbanism in East, Eastern Europe, in, specifically in, in, in Czechoslovakia, mm. and I looked at this project, uh, uh, this project called uh, Etare, Etarea, mm. by uh, Czech architect Doras Czelekowski and the Prague Design Institute, uh, and. So this is the un it's an unrealized project from 1967, designed for 135,000 inhabitants on a site near Prague, and as I say, unrealized, but it was exhibited uh, at the Montreal Expo in 1967. So that's like the main claim to fame of the project that it was at, at the Montreal Expo. But then it's, it's a kind of it's a kind of compelling intellectual record of of, uh, of the way in which uh, socialist architects also, not only architects within the West, uh, in the capitalist context, but also in, in, in socialism in the 60s, were uh, heavily influenced by cybernetics and, and system, system theory, specifically in the post-Stalinist uh, post uh, context, yeah, where, where, where cybernetics and system theory offer some kind of alternative to the cult of personality, as it was called. Yeah? Uh, and, and, and this is also exemplary of the widely shared view that socialist urbanization needs to be decoupled from industrialization yeah. and media labor. And so, yes, that area was to be a model communist city. Uh, so this, this was uh, done in, in the, during the Khrushchev's rule, where there was an idea that socialism is progressing and that the, the future of communism is on the horizon. Yeah. So this was, in Czechoslovakia, there was a con uh, constitution written in 1960, where it's the first sentence in the constitution says we are moving towards uh, 
uh, communism. As you, as you know, then in the 70s with the um, with Brezhnev and Soviet Union and so on, uh, this idea was quickly abandoned and it was replaced with the with the term really assisting socialism. So this future communism. Was, so so there's an interesting distinction between socialism and communism. Um, so this was really a, a design as an idea of communist uh, communist. Uh, City, which are centered around automated and algorithmically governed infrastructures and designed for intelligentsia. No? So, it, so on the one hand, uh, uh, cybernetics, automa automation. On the other hand, the change of uh, working, like a transformation of working class. Yeah? So who is the, not only, not only the, work, the, the blue collar labor, but also the white collar labor, yeah. technical intelligentsia. So, and, and, and here I look really how uh, Chalakowski and his team integrated cybernetic systems ecology and then the prevailing Marxist the humanist uh, philosophical framework under the under the rubric of living environment. Okay? So the type so the, this is the title actually uh, the title means the study of the living environment of the city. So uh, and, and I have another I have another chapter that was recently published that specifically examines uh, from a theoretical point of view and historical how uh, this term living environment and how it was discussed between the 60s, 70s and 80s where architecture has been thought of as a living environment and, and, this, and this is not limited to, uh, to Central Europe uh, my PhD student is now writing an abstract on, on Denmark and that is exactly the book written in 1971 which is called uh, the book is written by Ingrid Gell who is the wife of Jan Gell and the book is called The Living Environment. So, so, so there is a kind of a transnational uh, circulation of knowledge yeah, that in the 60s, 70s uh, explores or understands architecture as an environment. So it's again interesting link with the, with the notion of environmental power. And the, so just to conclude, the, the, this project's most, so we have some images of this is the plan. And uh, one, one drawing from the document, but the the, <coughs> uh, the project's most sensa sensational feature was that dwelling units in the city were to be serviced by a network of pneumatic tubes, delivering grocery, petrol, newspaper, and other daily goods on demand. Each district was serviced by a distribution center where. I quote, everything is automated and human labor is limited to supervision and control, end of quote. Supplied by an underground maze of deli delivery infrastructure, the network would be run by computers, monitoring reserves, evaluating optimal delivery routes, and keeping, I quote, a systematic track of market anomalies and forecasting its future behavior, end of quote. So the underlying premise of, uh, of of this proposal for pneumatic infrastructure was again the same as Cedric Price. Yeah? The premise was that automation would increase people's free time. Uh, so ra but rather than contributing to consumerism, it was suggested automated consumption would emancipate the inhabitants from mind-numbing activities. The time-saving the time infrastructure would put an end to repetitive shopping for groceries and everyday items, for example. Uh, and of particular interest uh, is this tension between, on the one hand, excessively, uh, excessively detailed technical specification of the network. So, for example, uh, somewhere in the report I found that they calculated uh, that the lag between order and delivery in the future at area was, will be between 2 minutes and 20 seconds and 11 minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> so, on the one hand, is this excessively detailed technical specification. And on the other hand, the premise that the city cannot be planned, but must be must remain uh, perpetually prototypical. Yeah? So, so the city must be, remain perpetually prototyped because because urban technological infrastructure is subject to accelerating cycles of obsolescence. So the report detailed one by one some 50 relationships within the Ethereum functional system. Uh, let me just show you this. Yeah. So the functional diagram of uh, it with words like 
population, living environment, production, uh, transport, uh, governing uh, services, and so on. And then uh, if you zoom in, there are, there are other. So, so there is a, there is about a fifty um, there is about uh, fifty relations in this. Uh, so, so the, the very detailed description one by one of these 50 relations within the, within the functional system outlined in this diagram. But, but, also, but then at the end of, uh, at the end of this report, at the end of these uh, eight, I think eight pages, it runs through the eight pages, and it suggested that this particular configuration is deba quote, debatable and possibly flow, flawed. End of quote. The only factor, in a way, and this is my interpretation, that was not considered subject to obsolescence or even possible critique was precisely this system's theoretical framework itself. What's even more interesting is that cybernetics uh, in this project was only tangen tangentially about computers. Yeah? In the first place, the city was conceptualized as a cybernetic super system that would, and I quote, behave in the same way as nature. Yeah? So cybernetics was not only about infrastructures and computers, but it was about the uh, it was about the idea of city as a self-regulating homo uh, homeostatic uh, system. The authors uh, Chelakovsky, uh, the author, believed that in the future, I quote, entire settlement systems will be controlled by a kind of central nervous system exactly comparable to those encountered in the natural environment. End of quote. So, so the neo-naturalism of, of Etaria, to uh, to refer to uh, Zeynep Alexander was not so much about lakes, rivers, and forests that, that nonetheless surrounded it, but it was about the homeostatic premises of systems ecology. Mm -hmm. So then, why is it interesting to revisit the case? It's because it poses questions about the biopolitics of state socialist urbanization, including the reorienting of revolutionary ethos from a class to techno-scientific register. The political enigma of, of this project is, not, is then not one of omniscient government, uh, you know, the, the big brother that uh, is watching us, but rather benevolent algorithms. It is less a totalitarian power than a, uh, that erases individual differences than, than a cybernetic one modulating complexity with good but eventually fatalistic intentions. And at the same time, of course, this vision of algorithmic different city and uh, represent a kind of unfamiliar uh, prequel to contemporary smart cities. So, so then, I mean, it's a historical study, but, but I think it's, it poses a <coughs> number of extremely uh, um, uh, questions that are extremely uh, relevant uh, today. Yeah. Okay, so let, let me really conclude. So this is the end. So let me just conclude with this one. This is the final slide. So, so back in 1987, So back in 1987, philosopher Isabel Stengers warned against confounding two meanings of complexity, a critique and science. Stengers asked whether complexity has, uh, had become a fad, that's the title of her essay, Complexity, a fad, cautioning against the neo-positivist implication of uh, what she calls the fresco of cosmic complexification. Is complexity a limit to universalizing systems thinking, complete with critical implications and democratic configurations, or is it a systemic quality that is tractable by scientific study? As if saying, oh, it's so simple, everything is complex. In other words, uh, we could ask, does complexity express the limit to our understanding of the world, or is it the property of the world? Yeah. Is, it about, is it about limit of our understanding, how the world is, or is it, is it the, the, is it the property of the world? Yeah? It's about epistemology or ontology, basically. Is it the ground for democratic dispute and contestation, or is it the hinge of a new type of expert power, one which I describe as environmental? So, so let me conclude by reiterating two points that underline uh, the set of reflections uh, that I shared with you today. So first, uh, it is the methodological question, how to address the rift between the historical, critical, and applied research in urbanism. And why I have no simple answer to this challenge, uh, which is uh, with not, only institute, not only intellectual, but also institutional. I think we need to experiment with forms of interdisciplinarity that exceed the, exceed the parallelism between, and I now want to quote again, Zainab 
uh, Alexander. So I think we need to experiment with forms of interdisciplinarity that exceeds the parallelism between flow diagrams of energy consumption, images of brain scans, map of transportation networks, and models of thermal distribution. Uh, so that's the, that's the challenge. What ca how can we think about interdisciplinarity that is not interdisciplinary centra centered around uh, parallelism of systems and data? Yeah, that we can see everything as data or everything as a system. So, so I'm not against interdisciplinarity, but I'm thinking about a different interdisciplinarity. And secondly, uh, and lastly, it is really the question of practice. How can we reinvent the democratic and political states of urbanism and govern urban futures and ourselves in them differently? Thank you very much. Hello, thank you.